5 by Black is the kind of gambit treatment that no Caro Can player would really ever dream of. But occasionally you might have to meet this, so I'm going to show you what Joe Gallagher does, and uh, something that he's won a lot of games with, in fact. He plays d takes e5, and after bishop c5, which is really black's only logical move, he plays his knight out to c3, attacking this pawn on d5. Now black's move here is queen out to b6, but then white reveals the point of his idea by allowing this check on f2 and going knight a4. If black then goes bishop f2 check, white plays the move king e2, and now there's no square for this queen on b6 to go to, and still protect the bishop on f2, without going to d4, which would allow the exchange of queens in a position in which white is simply a pawn up. After this move knight a4, black therefore has to play queen a5 check, and then c3 would leave black faced with the threats both of b4 and knight takes bishop on c5. Joe Gallagher's had this position on a couple of occasions. The first one was against Mr. Anich in Leon 1993. And Mr. Anich took this knight on g1 with his bishop on c5. Joe replied simply with rook takes g1. And after d takes e4, he developed his queen's bishop with bishop f4. Now white is already well ahead in development. After knight e7, Joe took this pawn on e4, fe, black castled, and now he played b4, which really leaves black's queen with no terribly good square, because if he goes back to c7, white can plonk his queen on d6 with queen d6. In fact, Anich was reduced to going queen back to d8, but then queen takes d8, rook takes d8, left him not only a pawn down in this endgame, but white also has a very strong pair of bishops. Not surprisingly, white went on to win. Gallagher's second opponent in this position was the Russian grandmaster Vladimir Tukmakov, and they played a game in Geneva 1994 in which Tukmakov instead of taking this knight on g1 with this bishop on c5, retreated the bishop all the way back to f8. Black is actually threatening to trap this knight on a4 now with the move b5. So white has to act fast. Joe played the move b4 himself, and after the queen came back to c7, he captured this pawn on d5. Took Markov, took the pawn on e5 with check, and after queen e2, black found himself facing an endgame in which he'd have an isolated pawn after queen takes e2 check, knight takes e2, and now c takes d5. Rather than defend such a passive position, took Markov decided to sacrifice a pawn with knight f6. But this was a rather strange decision, because after d takes c6, knight takes c6, he never had anything like enough compensation, and white went on to win in 48 moves. A more common way to lash out with e5 is by first taking this pawn on e4, d takes e4, and after fe, only then playing e5. Now this threatens queen h4 check, which white really has to do something about. So he develops this knight out to f3. We then come to a major parting of the ways, in which black can take this pawn on d4, and he can also develop his bishop on c8, 
either to e6 or to g4. After bishop g4, the reply bishop out to c4 actually threatens bishop takes f7 check, king takes f7, knight takes e5 check, simultaneously attacking black's king and this bishop on g4. However black defends against this threat to his f7 square, either with bishop h5 or knight d7, white is going to adopt the same kind of plan. He'll play c3, castle short, and perhaps bring his knight out to d2, and in either case he's going to have a really nice attacking position with a broad pawn center, pawns on e4 and d4, and his bishop lurking on this a2 g8 diagonal. Last but not least, he has an open f file, and this rook on f1, gazing towards the f7 square, makes the position look more like a king's gambit than a Karakan defense. Theory recommends the black actually stop white's bishop coming out to c4 by going bishop e6 himself first. At the moment, white still can't take this pawn on e5 with his knight because of knight takes e5, queen h4 check. Once again, attacking white's king and this pawn on e4. White should therefore support his centre with the move c3. After which knight d7, bishop d3, bishop d6, castles kingside, once again gives us a position in which white's rook is lurking on f1 on this open f file. Black actually has quite a serious problem in this position because if he continues developing naturally with knight g f6 then white can play the move knight g5 hitting this bishop on e6. Now if the bishop comes out to g4 then white can follow up with queen b3 attacking the pawn on f7 which would be mate and also the pawn on b7. When faced with this problem most blacks have resorted to the incredibly ugly f6 and this in fact is what Vlastimil Hort, a famous grandmaster, did against a little known opponent Jimenez in Moscow 1963. This game continued bishop e3, knight e7, Jimenez brought his knight out to d2 supporting the center, knight bd2, bishop c7, and now white exchanged off this light squared bishop on e6 which is covering some valuable squares with bishop c4. Hort took the bishop, bishop takes c4, knight takes c4, and now because of the pressure that white's developing, Hort felt obliged to take this pawn on d4, e takes d4, and after knight takes d4, he defended the e6 square with knight back to f8. Well this game must have been really humiliating for Hort because after queen h5 check, g6, queen back to f3, the grandmaster had to retreat his other knight and he went knight g8. Jimenez, needless to say, smashed him flat. After bishop e6, c3, a better move for black than knight d7 is to bring his other knight out to f6. I then recommend that white should take this pawn on e5 with knight takes e5. And after knight takes e4, just drop this knight back to f3. This was played in a game Gein and Garcia Palermo, Brussels 1986, which now continued bishop e7, bishop d3, the knight dropped back to d6, and white castled. And once again, taking a look at this position, we see that it resembles a king's gambit more than a boring old Karakan defence, because white's got these open e and f files which give him tremendous attacking chances. 
This is not the kind of stodge that Karakam players dream about. Rather than let white reinforce his centre with the move c3, many blacks prefer to take off this pawn on d4, e takes d4. White then plays his bishop out to c4, after which this bishop, combined with a rook coming to f1 after white castles kingside, will build up tremendously dangerous pressure against black's pawn on f7. Just how dangerous this can be was shown in two games which actually followed an identical path. In both cases, black was mated on move 14. Black played bishop out to b4 check. White answered with c3. Black then took this pawn on c3. And white now played bishop takes f7 check. King takes f7. Queen takes d8, capturing black's queen, but allowing another queen to appear after c takes b2 check, king e2, b takes a1, queen. At this moment, black is a whole rook and bishop ahead, but in both games, white of the last laugh with knight g5 check, king came up to g6. Queen e8 check, king came to h6, knight e6 check gave discovered check from this bishop on c1, g5, and now bishop takes g5 was mate, Caro crushed. Instead of bishop b4 check, Yasser Siruan played queen a5 check in his game against Fritzinger in Lone Pine 1976. Well, White played in thematic gambit style with c3, and now rather than take this pawn on c3, Siruan started to develop his kingside with bishop e7. Fritzinger actually stopped Black's knight coming out to f6 with the move e5. And after d takes c3, Knight takes c3, Siruan's knight d7 was met by the very surprising bishop takes f7 check. Siruan took the bishop, king takes f7, but after e6 check he decided that discretion was the better part of valour and he retreated his king to e8, e takes d7 check, Bishop takes d7, and now white castled kingside. Well, this position is really very uncomfortable for black, because he can no longer castle, and his poor king on e8 is condemned to wandering around the centre, possibly for the rest of the game. Siruan drew this game, but that might well be because he was Siruan, rather than any merits of his position. The sensible thing for black to do is to develop his kingside, but how exactly is he going to do this? If he plays, for example, bishop c5, white's reply, castles, is suddenly bringing even more force to bear against this pawn on f7. If black were then to bring his knight out to f6, white could play knight g5, and after castles, go e5, knight d5, queen h5, suddenly attacking both his pawn on h7 and the one on f7. After white's castles, in one game Levitsky Izbinski, St. Petersburg 1905, black defended against one of these knight lunges, knight g5 or perhaps knight e5, with the odd move f6. Well this is really asking for it, and white delivered with knight e5. Black took the knight, and after queen h5 check, decided to head for the hills with king d7. The game continued, queen takes e5, 
Bishop d6. Queen takes g7 check. And now knight e7 was forced. White brought in more pieces still with bishop g5. And after king c7, the move rook f7 forced rook e8. White brought in even more reinforcements with e5, bishop c5, knight d2, intending, for example, knight e4, or to activate this rook on a1. Although black's a piece up, I don't know many people that would enjoy his position. In order to neutralise this massive bishop on c4, a lot of blacks have been tempted into playing bishop out to e6. However, after bishop takes e6, fe, black is still way behind in development and he's also got a lot of weaknesses now. After castles, knight d7, Julian Hodgson won a game very quickly with knight g5, queen e7, knight f7. This simply wins material, and black actually gave up his queen with queen takes f7, rook takes f7, but was forced to resign after a mere 21 moves. Tartakova won a game even faster than Julian in a tournament in Budapest 1929, when after bishop takes e6, fe, castles, his opponent played the move bishop e7. The game continued, knight takes d4, queen d7, queen h5 check. And because g6 will be met by queen e5, black felt obliged to move his king away with king d8. The game continued, bishop e3, c5, and now Tartakova exploited the fact that black's queen and king are both on the d-file with a move rook d1. And after c takes d4, rook d4, bishop d6, he went e5, winning this bishop on d6 back and also keeping a tremendous attack against black's king in the centre. In a game Murey Kolechevich, Zurich 1991, black played bishop e7 and after castles played this odd looking move f6 which we've seen before. In this game Murray simply captured the pawn on d4 with knight takes d4. And after c5, knight b5, a6, Murray got the better endgame with queen takes d8 check, king takes d8, rook d1 check, knight d7, and now Murray brought the knight back to c3 from where it will jump into d5 on a later date. For those of you who might be disappointed with an endgame advantage after the series of bloodbaths we've just witnessed, I recommend the move c3 and after dc you can go queen e2. If black now plays c takes b2, bishop takes b2, White has got really tremendous development and is getting ready to smash black flat in the centre with e5. The best line for black, relatively speaking, is to play bishop e7, castles, knight f6. And in fact these moves bishop e7 and knight f6 can be played in either order. White should now play knight g5, and after castles, he slaughters this pawn on f7 with knight takes f7. 
If black now captures the knight with rook takes f7, white recaptures, bishop takes f7 check, king takes f7, and now white wins this knight on f6 with a move e5. The net result of all of this is that white simply wins the exchange. Black's king goes back to g8, white takes on f6, and black recaptures. And now white is the one with all the chances. After knight d2, the best move for black is to play his queen out to d5, in order to stop this white knight from coming into e4. White should play queen e2, and after bishop e6, his knight comes to e4 in any case. After black defends this bishop on f6 with knight d7, white can choose between bringing his bishop out to f4, or even bringing it out to g5, because bishop takes g5, knight takes g5, queen takes g5, allows queen takes e6 check. In all these lines, black is struggling for a miserable half point. Instead of giving up the exchange by taking this knight on f7, there is one game in which black played queen a5, a game Kuhn Grathvoll, Bundesliga 1985-86. Now this game went knight d6 check, discovered check from the bishop on c4, king h8, knight takes c8, rook takes c8, white brought his rook into play with rook f5, and now black played queen b4, hitting this bishop on c4. Now in the game, white played knight d2, but I prefer dropping this bishop back immediately with bishop d3, so as to play e5 on the next move. Now Kuhn actually lost this game, but I think if he'd have played my bishop d3, he would have got a very strong attack. Summing up, I think the attempt by black to exploit the move f3 with d, e, f, e, e5 rebounds on him because of the weakness of this f7 square. After knight f3, black's best shot is to play the bishop out to e6 in order to stop white's bishop coming to c4. But we've seen that this too doesn't manage to equalize for black. This is Grandmaster Damien Lemos here for OnlineChessLessons.net. First of all, I hope you enjoyed um, this video. If you would like to receive more free chess videos from us, you can just click the subscribe button below. I would also highly recommend signing up for my free mail course, The 10 Grandmaster Secrets to Dominate Chess. During this exclusive course from OnlineChessLessons.net, I'll share with you my own Grandmaster shortcuts to effective attacking, defending and growth hacks to improving your chess without um, complicated books or memorization. So sign up by clicking the sidebar on the right and I know you won't be disappointed. Once more, this is Damien uh, for OnlineChessLessons.net and I'll see you um, in my videos. Thank you.